In her mid-30s, Selma Lagerlof was single, living with her mother, and wondering if those student loans had been worth it, since no one seemed all that interested in her writing. But soon, that would all change. She'd be internationally famous, juggling the affections of two different women, become the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in literature, and later help a future winner of the same prize escape the Nazis. Hold on to your goose, folks, because this episode we're talking about the wonderful adventures of Selma. Selma Lagerlof was born in 1858 on the family estate of Morbacke, a manor house nestled in the picturesque lakes and forest of Vermland in the Swedish countryside. It was in this idyllic setting that Selma would discover her love for storytelling, first from listening to folk tales about trolls and fairies from her grandmother and other village folk, and then by reading voraciously while stuck indoors. You see, at age three, Selma suffered from a sudden paralysis in her legs, and it would take several years of treatment before she could walk again, though a limp and a bad hip would follow her for the rest of her life. Still, she writes of her childhood as a happy one, eating apples fresh from the orchard and singing along with her siblings as their father, who she was especially close with, played the piano. Eric Gustav was a lieutenant in the Varmland Regiment and a gentleman farmer, a light-hearted man who charmed all he met, and threw birthday parties for himself that evolved into something of a district festival. Peasant or aristocrat, all were welcome to enjoy song and dance, speeches and theatricals, feasting, and a prodigious amount of drinking. As one party-goer toasted, Eric Gustav, we know that, word in your power, you would take the whole world in your embrace. He would often be taken by grand, progressive ideas for the estate, but lacked the business sense and discipline to see any of them successfully implemented. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Selma's mother, Louisa Elizabeth, was said to be more reserved, with a love of work and indifference to pleasure, and the same dislike for all that was uncertain and adventurous. She was from a wealthy merchant family that owned a mine. Most of the local upper-class families were connected in some way to the iron industry, which drove the economy in mineral-rich Vermland. This would prove disastrous during Selma's teenage years, when the price of iron suddenly fell by half, part of a worldwide economic slump we now call the Long Depression. The causes are varied and still debated. Wild speculation in railroad investments triggering bank panics, financial turmoil after the Franco-Prussian War, or a swing to the gold standard in the U.S. and Germany causing rampant deflation. But the effects were clear. With iron near worthless, mines and ironworks shut down, leaving workers unemployed and owners unable to maintain their manor houses and staff. At Morbaka, the governess was let go, leaving Selma to take on the role of educating her younger sister, which she discovered she had a knack for. But it was her hobby of writing poetry that would lead her to a teaching career, when the verses she composed for a friend's wedding reception caught the attention of another guest. Author and women's education advocate Eva Frixell encouraged Selma to hone her talents by pursuing higher education. It was a bold proposal. Like most country women, Selma had been educated at home while her brothers went to school. But Selma was now 22, a bridesmaid, and perhaps realizing that the heterosexual married life was not something she wanted for herself. And here, Eva was offering another option, one of independence in the city, and a dignified way for an upper-class woman to take on work. So, Selma took out a loan and moved to Stockholm to study at the Women's Teacher Training College. Once in the big city, she became an avid fan of the theater and opera, made literary friends, and even published some poems in a women writer's periodical, though it didn't generate much interest. Graduation in 1885 was bittersweet, as her father passed away that same year. Once the life of the party, he had transitioned towards the more depressing kind of drinking as he struggled and failed to save their financial situation. It soon became clear that Morbaka, like most of the once great manor houses that stood for generations, would have to be sold. Visiting her childhood home one last time before strangers moved in, she was inspired to turn her memories of life there into a novel, to save for herself what she could of her home, the dear old stories, the careless days of blissful peace, and the beautiful landscapes with the long lakes and blue shifting hills. 
Selma, along with her mother and aunt, moved to Lanskrona, where she would teach at a girls' school while writing on the side. She was well-liked by students, and part of an arts appreciation circle with her colleagues, where her writer's soul would often shine through. When asked her favorite color, she replied, Sunset. Selma's first big break came in 1890, when the first few chapters of her novel won a magazine's literary competition. With the prize money and support of friends, Selma was able to take a sabbatical to finish her book, and the following year, at the age of 33, Selma published her first novel, The Saga of Josta Berling. The novel was a radical departure from the naturalist style that had dominated Scandinavian literature for the last 20 years. Harshly realistic works like August Strindberg's The Red Room, which is about an aspiring actor who moves to the city and is quickly disillusioned by industry corruption and pretense. In contrast, Josta Berling injected those same bleak realities with the wonder and imagination of epic sagas and childhood daydreams, a grounded neo-romanticism. With supernatural elements weaved in, unemployed veterans of the Napoleonic Wars became the modern wandering adventurer, neglected ironworks, the mysterious ruins of some fallen civilization, all told in a meandering style that mimicked oral storytelling. Each chapter was self-contained, but essential to the overarching story and conflict, between revelry and romance on the one hand, and responsibility and the common good on the other. However, the initial reception was disappointing, and Selma dejectedly returned to teaching. But then, the Danish version came out. Literary critic George Brandeis, basically the Siskel and Ebert of books in terms of influence, having for over 20 years ruled with almost unlimited authority, recognized the differences as original rather than amateur. His glowing review catapulted the novel into popularity in Denmark, which soon spilled back over into Sweden. The game-changing positive review did have one quibble, however, that the elopements and kisses had lacked fire and were clearly written by a spinster. This would cease to be a problem in 1894, when Selma Lagerlöf met Sophie Elkin. It was New Year's Day in Stockholm, when Selma was recognized and approached by another writer, an elegant woman dressed in all black, just a few years older than Selma's 36. Her name was Sophie Elkins, daughter of a prominent Jewish family and a widow who had lost both her husband and young daughter to tuberculosis. Although 14 years had passed since their deaths, Sophie still wore black mourning clothes and would continue to do so for the rest of her life, a practice popularized by reigning British monarch Queen Victoria, who by then had been mourning her husband Albert for the past 30 years. Sophie was exceptionally well-read, fluent in several languages, and an experienced traveler, the kind of person who wanted to live adventure as well as write it, which she did under the pen name Rest Rowest, Flemish for If I Rest, I Rust. Sophie was grace and intelligence, passion and tragedy, and Selma was instantly smitten. As the conversation wound down and it was time to part, Selma went for it raising her hand to Sophie's face and moving aside her widow's veil to see her face unobscured. Looking into her eyes, she said with no doubt an unbelievable amount of lesbian swagger, or the 19th century Swedish equivalent, You are very beautiful, and I know we will become friends. Since they lived in different cities, the pair began corresponding by letter. And unlike with some of history's more ambiguous romantic friendships, Selma is refreshingly direct about asking Sophie to clarify her intentions behind romantic-sounding words, and how they might be acted on in person. These kisses of yours that you convey in your letters, they are a great puzzlement to me. How am I to understand such merchandise? Are they promissory notes, or samples without value? Are such debts to be repaid in rooms milling with people, or in the greenhouse at Mass? In Copenhagen, I see so many relationships between women, that I must try to comprehend in my own mind what nature's intention is with this. Now, I would love to give you Sophie's responses to these questions, but unfortunately, their letters have never been translated into English, so I'm limited to whatever small excerpts third parties have translated and whatever context they've decided to provide. For example, at some point Sophie wrote hands off in a letter to Selma before a planned meeting. 
Some have presented this as evidence that Selma's affections were one-sided, or that their connection was strictly emotional rather than physical. It was only after I happened to rent an article by the Swedish version of PBS through Google Translate that I got some much-needed context. The previous day on the train, as Sophie was about to alight at her stop, Selma had kissed her goodbye quite passionately. Hands off was a warning to not be so reckless again. Sophie's hometown of Jotobori may have been Sweden's multi-faith bastion of liberalism, but homosexuality had been officially criminalized in 1864, carrying a penalty of up to two years hard labor. And unlike most other countries, Swedish law applied to women as well as men. It wasn't safe out in the open. They'd need somewhere away and private. So it was a good thing our Princess Charming had a castle. The city of Jotobori is home to the largest port in all of Scandinavia, and was one of only four Swedish cities where Jewish people were allowed to do business, before the Jewish regulations were repealed in 1838. So it was here that August Abrahamson made his fortune as a wholesale merchant of haberdashery goods like gloves, shirt collars, and other assorted bits of 19th century charm. Haberdashery was apparently a big deal back in the day, because even after extensive charitable giving, there was still plenty left over to purchase a breathtaking estate in Nass. But in a tragic twist, August's opera singer wife would pass away just as they finished settling in, at only 33 years old. And with no children, August was now alone in his castle. He did have a nephew, though. Otto Solomon had just finished school, so Uncle August invited him to move in and work for him managing the estate as a bookkeeper and whatever else he wanted to do to fill his time. And what Otto really wanted to do was teach. He started with tutoring the farmhands working the gardens, then dabbled a bit at turning the place into a school, before transitioning into what would make Nas world famous. Traditional Swedish handicrafts. It was the 1870s, Industrialization had reached everywhere, even the remote Swedish countryside. No one did needlepoint or woodwork for their everyday items anymore. It was cheap and more convenient to just buy something that had been made in a factory. So, to prevent these traditional skills from disappearing entirely, Otto established the College of Traditional Handicrafts. Every summer, teachers would flock to Nass to learn, then disperse all over Sweden, and later all over the world, to pass on those skills. I feel like the translation of handicrafts doesn't fully capture the scope of this program. It was six weeks living on campus at the estate, immersed in everything Swedish culture. Woodworking and crafts, of course, but also traditional song and dance, gardening, exercise, and equally as important, recreation. Attendees were encouraged to converse with each other without regard for social or economic differences. And as the program became more popular internationally, This created a wonderfully collegial atmosphere for cultural exchange, earning it the title of Sweden's Window to the World. It was here that basketball was first introduced to Sweden, when a group of Americans attending the program in 1897 taught their fellow students how to play. From the 1890s, at least 50 students a year were foreigners coming from as far away as Japan, and graduates would go on to teach as far away as Peru. Otto's affable nature and ability to make everyone feel at ease gave the multinational group a sense of shared camaraderie, and was key in pulling off the most controversial aspect of the school. It was co-ed. Sweden had only had a women's college since the 60s, so to have a co-ed program in the early 80s with men and women both boarding on campus was downright scandalous. Even Otto's charms couldn't dispel the hostility those first women received from their male counterparts, But with some recruiting efforts, by 1900, the program would be nearly 40% women. Otto was a firm believer in having women in education, seeing it as necessary for women's emancipation and independence in the modern world. So Otto was, of course, delighted when his sister Sophie invited her new teacher friend over to the estate for the Easter holidays. A teacher and an up-and-coming writer who, like Otto, was preserving something of pre-industrial Sweden for posterity which was one of the reasons for Selma's rising popularity. As industrialization and city life became the norm, people who felt like cogs in a capitalist machine craved Selma's nostalgic, pastoral descriptions of a bygone Sweden. Life had been beautiful in this place. They had spun flax, but had sung folk songs as they spun. 
They had worked hard at their history and their grammar, but they had also played theater and written verses. They had worn homespun clothes, but they had also been able to lead carefree and independent lives. Uncle August, who was by then an old man, was presumably happy to see his niece find companionship. He knew what it was like to lose a spouse unexpectedly and find your household empty. And while Otto would always be there for them both, the young man was now grown with a wife and kids and a really intense cycling hobby. Uncle August in his old age might have felt relief to see that his niece had found someone who could be her family after he was gone. He would pass a few years later, and Selma would regret having been too shy and awkward to tell him how much she appreciated his kindness. The two women would stay in the South Wing, actually a completely separate building away from the main castle, and also very private. And if you're wondering why these images are suddenly in color, it's because Castle Nas is still a hub for Swedish culture, but now is the country's best preserved example of a 19th century estate. The castle hosts events like the Midsummer Festival, still supports local artisans, and you can even have your wedding there or book a stay overnight, including renting out Selma and Sophie's residence, which is also the designated bridal suite. A lot of the original decor is preserved or restored, designer wallpaper from Paris, antique furniture, and porcelains likely procured via Sophie's father, who had been a merchant specializing in the product. Selma was one of those writers who could be rather blatant about putting her real-life experiences into stories, so it's interesting to see how that works with the parts of her life she couldn't tell. Two months after that Easter visit, she would publish The Downy Girl, a romantic short story that starts with a prominent man taking his fiancée, a humble baker's daughter, to stay with his rich uncle who does crafts. But it's only on the surface that Selma relates to the baker's daughter. Her real avatar in the story is the rich uncle. In the story, he's not an elderly widower. Like Selma, he's a bachelor pushing middle age who had given up on ever finding love. Until he finds it where he's not supposed to, with the fiancé of his nephew. The tale of forbidden romance triumphing over adversity no longer lacked fire. It was a hit and would be made into films in 1919 and 1941. After that first Easter visit, Selma and Sophie would spend almost every summer together at Nass, 22 summers in total. It seems like the only summers they missed were the ones where they were already together abroad. Because if you're going to use the castle card less than three months after meeting, apparently the only place to go from there is full on, I can show you the world. Technically, running off to the continent together in 1895 was a work trip. By now, Selma's publications had garnered enough acclaim to receive a grant from the Swedish Academy to pursue writing full-time, and a royal traveling scholarship to go find inspiration and new experiences. Of course, to make sure that grant money was put to judicious use, Selma would need an experienced traveling companion who would know which artist hotels were in fashion, and could introduce her to all the right people. Luckily, Sophie Elgin was just such a person. Switzerland, Germany, and Belgium were all on the itinerary, but it was in Sicily where they lived it up, eating charming breakfast with a whole liter of $3 wine. Selma bought a trumpet and cut off all her hair, which had the effect of making her look like a newly released convict. In the company of a woman dressed in mourning, I like to imagine this had the effect of scaring off any would-be harassers that would otherwise see two female tourists sloshed before noon as easy targets. The trip had changed Selma from the unassuming country girl who had never left Scandinavia. A letter to a friend back home described the experience as a life of freedom. It was productive as well. Selma's next novel, Miracles of the Antichrist, would be set in Sicily, about a statue of the Christ child secretly swapped with a false idol that begins to perform Christ-like miracles. Shortly after, and now writing under her own name, Sophie would publish her most famous work, John Hall, A Story of Old Yotabori, a historical novel about the son of a rich merchant who squanders his wealth. George Brandeis would also give this a positive review, and a literary power couple was born. Selma and Sophie would go on to make seven more trips abroad together, but none as spectacular as the nine-month journey across Europe in what was then called the Orient, during which they bought a handheld camera. Their travel photos were collected and published in 2017, 
And it's kind of amazing to see a lesbian couple's casual vacation photos from the year 1900. They visited ancient Greek amphitheaters, walked the Mustar Bridge in modern Bosnia, stayed at the Hotel Dimitri in Damascus, and took a boat ride on the Nile in Cairo. Some pictures remind you that even for wealthy women, travel before automobiles was significantly more involved than just booking a ticket. At times, the adventurous pair went by camel, or a box carried between two donkeys. The journey had proved inspiring to both writers. Selma soon published Jerusalem, dedicating it to Sophie, her companion in life and letters. The story was inspired by a group of Swedish peasants who had moved to Jerusalem to await the Second Coming. Their commune is actually still there, though it's now operating as a luxury resort. While Jerusalem was a hit, Sophie's own work inspired by their experiences in Egypt flopped. This reportedly worked Sophie into despair and anxiety due to professional jealousy, but in light of more recent revelations, I'd wager that any distress was much more personal. A year before Selma and Sophie had left on their grand adventure to the Orient, Selma had moved near her sister's house in Fallon, so they could take turns caring for their aging mother and aunt. There, she met Valbury Orlander, a textbook writer and chair of the local suffragette society, who greatly admired Selma's work. So much so, in fact, that she quickly became Selma's literary assistant, taking care of all manner of administrative work like, as Selma would soon describe it, a proper author's wife would do. It was after Selma and Sophie had returned from their trip to the Orient that Valbury would become involved with manuscript edits, having the gall to disagree with Sophie's suggestions for Jerusalem. Sophie writes, Oh, my dear, you are not going to choose Valbury. Was it Valbury? Instead of me, are you? Can we just take a moment to appreciate the level of shade that is taking the time to handwrite that you can't be bothered to remember someone's name? The fact that Selma did end up going with Valbury's suggestions over Sophie's, and that it had apparently been the right call, was doubtless a blow to Sophie's ego. Sophie was the magic in Selma's style of magical realism, the beautiful princess in a far-off castle that she could only be with in summer, overseas, or in her dreams. But it seemed like Valbury was the realism, the one who would be there in Fallon with her every day, a fellow Vermlander who understood Selma's writings about rural life in a way Sophie couldn't. By 1902, Selma and Valbori were undeniably involved, with Selma writing to her, Each time you are here, I try so truly to kiss you so that I might feel satisfaction for a few days, yet I long for you again even before you disappear through the gate. And in a moment of uncharacteristic sauciness, adds that if Valbori stayed overnight, that would be divine. Though Selma cautioned Valbori not to write more than every five days, to avoid setting off Sophie's fragile nerves. Valbori seemed to have made those letters count, though, writing things apparently so explicit that Selma tore them up. I tear up your letters with a heavy heart. I wish I always had them to warm myself with, but I dare not. No one, no one in this world has ever loved me as you. It's not clear if she was more worried about Sophie or scandal, but she definitely resented the salacious way people gossiped about sapphic women. I wish we did not have to be sensible, that all men would bore to hear that we hold one another. But after a year, Valbori had presumably grown tired of being the other woman, and announced her intention to leave for a job in Stockholm, though Selma convinced her to stay. I often wondered why I couldn't let you go when I saw that you wanted to leave, but it was like letting life's sure best happiness go. Speaking of ruining a good thing, let's take a step back here and examine the wild left turn our fairy tale romance just took, because there are a couple more Rashomon style twists here. When I started researching for this video, I found a lot of conflicting information, probably because the most recent English language biography I could find was published in 1932 when Selma's relationships with both Sophie and Valbury had to be described as noble friendships, which is also my new favorite euphemism for its comical grandiosity. The other definitive semi-contemporary biography seems to have been Ellen Wagner's in 1942, a book which earned her admission to the Swedish Academy, only the second woman to receive such an honor, the first being Selma herself. 
The Swedish Academy is a group of 18 distinguished writers and academics that are appointed for life and meant to be the nation's highest authority on language and literature, basically the Supreme Court of Writing. Ellen lived on an organic farm with her friend, Flory Gate, after they both divorced their husbands, so it's possible she had access to contexts that other biographers wouldn't have been privy to, even if those details wouldn't have made it into print. I haven't been able to read it, but supposedly it paints Sophie in a very negative light, jealous of her more talented friend, and prone to fits of temper and despair that Selma was burdened with soothing. It's a characterization that has stuck around until today, though it might not be a fair one. In putting together the biography, Ellen relied heavily on personal interviews with Valbury, the only one of the three still alive by then. Given their rather intense romantic rivalry, which it kind of seems like Sophie won, it's unsurprising that Valbury wouldn't have good things to say. Also unsurprising is that a negative portrayal of a Jewish person published in 1942 would be embraced and promoted by Nazi sympathizers, including a member of the Swedish Academy that had lauded the biography. Fred, whose name I won't bother to learn how to pronounce, was a writer who loved Hitler and seemed to personally have it out for Sophie Elkin. Sophie wrote mainly historical novels, meticulously researched ones usually set in Sweden. She was born and raised in Sweden. Her parents had been born and raised in Sweden, and she considered Swedish history her own. This seemed to enrage our villain, while historians praised her 1910 novel on the murderers of King Gustav III for its vivid characterizations and exciting pace, with an eminent professor even using it as a starting point for his lectures, Fred wielded his considerable influence against it with a harshly negative review in a major daily paper. Sophie would never publish again. Fred was really into getting rid of viewpoints he didn't like, attending a university book burning in Berlin, and praising the fire as purifying. So when he became a member of the Swedish Academy and saw an opportunity to purify Selma's image, he took it. It had always been inconvenient for people like Fred that the writer who had written so beautifully of rural Sweden had a Jewish writer as her closest confidant. Casting Sophie as a jealous, inferior writer fit their worldview perfectly, even though some of that professional jealousy may have just been the only plausible way to disguise relationship jealousy. It wasn't until 1990, when Selma's personal papers were unsealed, that the true extent of her relationship with Valerie was released in their letters. Perhaps Sophie was just more discreet, but if her letters contained any similar clear-cut intentions, no one has bothered to translate them into English, which is probably why I found a lot of websites saying that Selma had only ever dated Valbury, and that Sophie truly was just a good friend. However, Ying Todger Nielsen, the Swedish literary scholar who curated and published Selma's letters with Sophie and Valbury in the 1990s, believes the relationship with Sophie was romantic, writing that Selma was two-timing both women. Without being able to vibe-check the Letters and Wagner biography myself, it's hard to know how to portray the whole drama. But from that quote about no one loving her like Valbury, I have a theory. In more homophobic times, it was common to have to settle for a situationship. Same-sex romance was, quite literally, the love that dare not speak its name. From Selma's writings and Train Kiss Stunt, it's clear that she was a hopeless romantic who probably wouldn't deal well with being an undefined part-time lover, or suddenly reverting back to pen pals after nine months of freedom. If Valbury could offer a relationship that felt normal and domestic, a proper author's wife instead of just stolen moments, that would have held some appeal. Whatever went down, things settled into an uneasy peace. Valbori put Selma in touch with a textbook publisher who commissioned a children's geographical reader of Sweden, but it was Sophie who would travel all around Sweden with Selma as she spent the next three years putting together what would become her most famous work. Before publication, Valbori read the manuscript aloud to a classroom to gauge reception, and it was overwhelmingly positive. The assignment had been to make a geography reader, but Selma had written an instant children's classic, The Wonderful Adventures of Niels. A little brat of a boy ends up cursed miniature by an elf, and riding on the back of a goose, he explores the geography and nature of Sweden, has magical adventures, and learns valuable lessons. Selma's trademark self-insert is refreshingly more subtle here, 
apparent in the boy's oddly specific concerns about being cursed miniature, which sound much more like an adolescent Selma's concerns about what growing into a woman would mean for her. He was separated from everything now. He could no longer play with the other boys. He could not take charge of the farm after his parents were gone, and certainly no girl would think of marrying him. Niels is ashamed, miserable, and worried about his parents finding out, until the goose, which I guess is Sophie, takes him away on a wild adventure to see the world, a journey that was only possible because he was cursed. It's a beautiful little Easter egg for those already familiar with her life, wrapped up in a fun adventure that teaches about geography, nature, and being kind to others. Of all Selma's works, this would be the most popular and most beloved, so universally that it was printed on Swedish money from 1991 until 2015. It was also perfect timing for monetary success, as Selma's beloved old home Morbaka, or the rundown remains of it anyway, had been put up for sale. Her mom thought it was silly and sentimental to go back to the old place when their apartment had modern conveniences like electricity and modern heating, but Selma was determined to fix it up. It would be expensive, but yet again, it seemed like timing was on her side. For the last 25 years, poet and literary critic Carl David Afwirzen had been the permanent secretary of the Swedish Academy, the institution that would be tapped to determine the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. And for 25 years, he had resisted being impressed by any modern Swedish literature, viewing the naturalists as vulgar, with their unvarnished descriptions of life's problems and seedy underbellies. He was also a deeply religious man, and believed poetry should reveal a higher world of purity and peace. While Selma had a lighter touch than the naturalists, the alcoholic priest protagonist of Josta Berling, and having a novel called Miracles of the Antichrist, didn't exactly win his favor. He had blocked her nomination on five occasions. He also wasn't impressed that Selma was a woman. Similar detractors mocked her as a fairy tale aunt, an old maid who makes up stories to entertain the children, rather than a writer of serious literature. But since the success of Niels, nominations for Selma had ramped up in the Academy. After all, the criteria for the Nobel at the time was a lofty and sound idealism. And after years of Scandinavian writers being known for their profound and savage gloom, there was finally a prominent author who fit the bill. Where's your national pride, Carl? In the end, a record 21 nominations were enough to overrule the old fellow, and Selma was awarded the 1909 Nobel Prize in Literature, in appreciation of the lofty idealism, vivid imagination, and spiritual perception that characterize her writings. She was the first woman and the first Swede to win the award, as well as the first gay person to win a Nobel Prize in any category. Her acceptance speech was given with her trademark humility, crediting the people and places that had inspired her writing. The old men and women sitting in their small gray cottages as one came out of the forest, telling me wonderful stories of water sprites and trolls, and enchanted maidens lured into the mountains. It was they who taught me that there is poetry in hard rocks and black forests. And I am in debt not only to people, there's the whole of nature as well. The animals that walk the earth, the birds in the skies, the trees and flowers, they have all told me some of their secrets. Selma also mentions Sophie not once, but twice. First by name in a list of the great Scandinavian authors that paved the way for her, Sophie Elkin, who has brought history to life. And second, in a way that's unnamed but unmistakable. My good friend and traveling companion, who not only took me south and showed me all the glories of art, but made life itself happier and lighter for me. With the prize money, Selma set about restoring to its former glory the childhood home that had inspired so much of her writing, but with electricity and other modern comforts. She also set about restoring the apple orchard in the kitchen gardens, where she loved spending time with her new puppy car. Like her father, she dabbled a bit in farming, oats in particular, but it wasn't a commercially successful endeavor. She was less interested in industrial efficiency and more in cultivating unique specimens, many of which she brought back from her travels with Sophie. The progeny of an umbrella plant cutting taken from outside their hotel in Cairo in 1899 is still thriving today. From 1912, many of Selma's works would be adapted for stage and screen, 
including a 1927 silent production of The Saga of Josta Berling, which was the film that got an unknown young actress named Greta Garbo first noticed by Hollywood. If you're watching this channel, you might know her from her role as Queen Christina, where she famously cross-dressed and kissed her lady-in-waiting, or from her personal links to notorious sapphic star chaser Mercedes de Acosta. The quiet life in Morbaca suited Selma more than the fame that followed her outside the estate, though she did direct her influence towards supporting feminist and pacifist causes that Sophie was also involved with. Selma would give a notable speech at the International Alliance for Female Suffrage in 1911 in Stockholm. In 1921, Sophie Elkin would pass away at the age of 68, and Selma would be the one to deliver her a moving eulogy. Sophie had designated Selma to be the executor of her estate, and Selma dedicated a room at Morbaca as the Sophie Elkin Room, where some of Sophie's effects and family portraits were displayed. No word on Valbury's reaction, though she visited the estate frequently and must have seen it. That same year, a young Jewish writer in Germany named Nellie Sachs sent a copy of her first book to Selma, saying that reading the saga of Joost de Berlin when she was a teenager had inspired her to become a writer herself, and that she began corresponding. Perhaps it was talking with Nellie that got Selma started on turning Sophie's writings on growing up as a Jewish Swede into a book, although she wouldn't manage to finish it. When Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933, causing a wave of Jewish emigration, Selma would designate all the profits from her new book Harvest to be donated to support Jewish refugees. It was a bold move. Outside of Sweden, Germany was by far the country where her work was most popular. Romanticized tales of the pre-industrial Nordic countryside unfortunately really appealed to Nazis, who liked to think that's what life would be like without gays and Jews, completely ignorant of the fact that it was created by a lesbian who was in love with a Jew. Outraged by Selma's support of Jewish refugees, the official radio network of Germany canceled a birthday program they had planned to honor her. On November 9th of 1938, what would be known as the Night of the Broken Glass, the Nazis and their supporters would unleash a night of terror against Jewish communities across Germany and Austria, burning synagogues, ransacking homes, and destroying Jewish businesses with sledgehammers. At least 90 Jews would be murdered, and 30,000 Jewish men arrested and sent to concentration camps. And it's the night often pinpointed as the start of the final solution. Seeing the writing on the wall, Nellie Sachs had a friend traveling to Sweden pass on a message to Selma, asking for help getting her and her mother out of Germany. By then, Selma was 80 years old and sick, but still had influence and could write letters. It took over a year, but the paperwork was in order by May 1940, and Nellie and her mom would board one of the last passenger flights from Berlin to Stockholm, just a week before they were scheduled to report to a concentration camp. Nellie would never get to meet Selma in person. The great novelist had passed away shortly before the pair arrived but Nellie Sachs would still have a chance to thank her. During her own Nobel acceptance speech in 1966, for her poems and plays that reflected her experiences during the Holocaust. In accordance with Selma's will, Morbaka was turned into a memorial estate open to the public. The estate's original furnishings and paintings have been preserved, so you can see it just as it was when Selma lived there. Selma's gardens are still productive, and you can even purchase Morbaka oats and honey produced on site. There's also a gift shop that looks like it has all the books I couldn't find out here in California. While the English-speaking world seems to have largely forgotten about her, she's still a well-known figure in Scandinavia. Prince Carl Philip and Princess Sophia even visited Morbaka in 2016. Also in accordance with Selma's will, her personal letters with Valbury and Sophie were to be sealed until 50 years after her death, the year 1990. Sweden wouldn't decriminalize homosexuality until 1944, four years after Selma had passed. But unlike so many gay historical figures, she didn't have her personal papers destroyed. Sure, she didn't want to deal with the creepy invasive questions, unsolicited opinions, or even criminal charges that would have come with being openly gay. But that didn't mean she liked having to hide such a large part of herself, especially when so much of her writing was semi-autobiographical. Selma had spent most of her 81 years telling stories. Stories that were full of magic and romance, but not perfect happy fairy tales. She doesn't gloss over the hero's faults or life's ugliness. 
But in the end, you're still always left with a sense of hope. That her letters were sealed instead of destroyed makes the end of Selma's story feel similar. Perhaps the lofty idealism that had earned her Nobel recognition also gave her hope that one day, even though she wouldn't live to see it, she wouldn't have to hide anymore. And if you've made it this far, dear listener, it looks like she was right. And that's a wrap for episode two of our Great Mind series. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to be alerted when the next episode comes out, just make sure to hit that subscribe button. Also, massive thank yous to all the subscribers from last episode. I was not expecting that many people to endure an hour of me struggling to work a microphone in PowerPoint. But if you're new to the show, and that for some reason sounds like fun, go check out episode one on Dr. Joe. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you all next time.